Do you even scale? Welcome back ML Pros. And we are back here today to ensure that you never again are confused about feature scaling. What is it? Why is it important? Which technique should you use? How to do it in Python? And most importantly, which algorithms need it actually? I'll give you a complete list on what algorithms you want it on. So next time it will be a piece of cake when you train. Since guidance is key for the community, be sure to write down in the comments which technique you use most often so everybody can learn from you. What is feature scaling? Feature scaling is a collection of different methods that all achieve the very same thing. They put numbers into perspective. They turn one set of numbers into another set of numbers that is easier to process for various machine learning algorithms. The simplest example is a max apps scaler, where you simply divide each data point by the absolute maximum that you find over all the data points in your data set, such that then all numbers will be between minus one and one since that kind of sounds complicated. Imagine all people on earth measuring their age not anymore in years. But instead we call the oldest number one and to find out your age you simply divide the number of days you lived by the number of days that he lived. 10,420 days and still counting boys. Yeah, I keep track of that and I'm kind of weird. I hope you like this video anyhow. Why is feature scaling important? Two main reasons. One, some algorithms just work and perform better when the data is scaled. And two, many algorithms converge much faster when the data is scaled. Let's, for an example, consider neural networks and how a gradient descent might perform on it. On the left, we see intuitively that the paths to the global minimum is much longer than the path on the right with feature scaling. Since speed is crucial, make sure to scale all your numerical variables. And back to reason one, let's look at this PCA example from Scikit-Learn. On the left, we see it perform without feature scaling and on the right after standard scaling, which we will look into in a bit. We see intuitively that the classes are separated visually much better. The reason for this is that when multiple variables are on a different scale, they are not treated by the algorithm as equally important. More on this later. Key takeaway, scale your data unless you are sure your algorithm is not affected by it, which I'll show you later as well. Which feature scaling to use? While there are many algorithms that you can use, we will shortly walk over the most common seven and you will find what you need. So the max apps scaler and the min max scaler, hard to say. The max app scaler we already discussed. The min max scaler basically is subtracting the minimum from each data point and then dividing by the difference of maximum and minimum. This will then put all numbers between zero and one also called like and no like. How this looks we can see here. I took some data from the iris data set and what you have to know is that the original data was between three and seven. The max app scaler divides now each number through seven. And what you can tell from this image or this big red blob up here is that the numbers were all above, like let's say three. And this leads to this like somewhat skewed uh, concentration of data points here in the upper right quadrant. The min max scaler divides, as you remember, through the difference of minimum and maximum. So you will actually see that the lowest point will be somewhere in the left corner and the data will be spread much more evenly. These two scalers work well when you have a little variance and they should not be used when you have outliers. Generally prefer the ones I'll show you next. The standard scaler, the most common type of scaler that centers all data around zero and then goes in steps of standard deviation. This type of scaler assumes you are working with normal distributed data and outliers are not too crazy. So be sure to only use it then. The formula looks simple and it subtracts the mean and divides by the standard deviation. How this looks we can see here. As we notice immediately the values are not anymore between 0 and 1 and the data is spread way more evenly as mentioned in steps of standard deviation. What you can also now tell is that this point here is three standard deviations away from the mean. Three, the robust scaler. It's kind of the same, but different in the sense that it works with outliers. Instead of subtracting the mean, you subtract the median. And instead of dividing by the standard deviation, you scale according to the interquartile range. Without getting too mathy, let's just look at the scaling process. The robust scaler is now the violet point and we can see that the far outliers are generally like the data points at the edge 
wander a bit closer to the mean. Apart from this, it's pretty much the same. Especially consider this scaler when you think outliers play a big role in your dataset. Quantile transformer scalar. This is now getting mathematically a bit more complicated, but what you need to know is that the quantile transformer turns your data into a normal distribution. And this can be very useful to compare two data columns that have different unit types like kilogram and Celsius. But it does so in a non-linear way, which can be a bit problematic. We are back in the zero one range as we can see. I mean, it's kind of nice to look at because it's now, visually speaking, very nicely distributed, but it's also really not the same distribution as it used to be. So keep that in mind when you use this transformer or scaler. Power transform scaler is a family of transformations with a lot of different variations that is used to make data more Gaussian, so to speak. Power transformations are very useful when we have to deal with skewed features and our model is sensitive to the symmetry of the distribution, like for example, K nearest neighbors. While there exists some exotic scaling method, I would say these are the most common ones you will want to test. One final look here at the power transform as we can see, it's very close to the robust scaler and standard scaler with the settings that I used, but it turned, especially here, the y-axis a bit more into the middle range, which is interesting to look at, but it can be wildly different depending on what algorithm of the power transformation family you use. How to do feature scaling in Python. All the examples down below I showed you of these scalers have been generated by this code snippet. And it's pretty much always the same procedure. You import and install sklearn, you import pre-processing, and then if you go into the documentation, you will see all the scalers I presented today and many more. You can then initialize it. So basically just pre-processing the scaler. This will be a scaler here. And then you fit. So fit transform basically first fits the scalar, so some parameters has to be learned. If you think about the min-max scalar, basically it just finds the minimum and the maximum. For the standard scalar, it also has to calculate the standard deviation and so on. So that's the fitting process. Then the next process is transforming. There it takes like a pandas data frame or some numpy array and transform it, it to that scale that we chose. Now fit transform actually does both. And this is neatly here combined into a pandas data frame row. So it's again back in our data frame and we can easily plot it down below. All in all, just remember SQLearn pre-processing, go through the documentary, there will be some code snippet that you can immediately use. So not hard, no excuses. When is feature scaling required and which algorithms need it? So now we're really getting down to what you really care about. I mean, in the end, if you're not working with one of the algorithms that need it, you won't use it. But I'll break it down for you. On a high level, you can think that every time you use like some distance-based algorithm, you will need feature scaling. If in contrast you have like some rule-based algorithm, you won't need it. If we go now here through the list, we see linear regression. Yes, it needs it. It's a distance-based algorithm to some extent. The same here with k-nearest neighbors, right? It calculates the distances between the nearest neighbors. SVMs, neural networks, I showed you it's mostly for speed, but sometimes also for performance. Here the family of, let's say, rule-based algorithms, especially here random forest, I mean a clear rule-based split, they don't care so much about whether your data is scaled. It doesn't hurt, so I mean, if your takeaway for today is just scale your data, that's also fine but it's not necessarily needed. Also these like uh, dimension reduction thingies. When do you do your feature scaling? Short answer before training, but, and this is important, let's imagine an example where we are trying to predict the number of days that I will still live. As I mentioned earlier, my age is if we min-max scale around 0.28, so 10,000 something divided by the longest living person. And the model's output will now be some strange shit like 0.660 years, I hope. The point is that you have to convert your numbers now back into human numbers and this is exactly why you need to store your feature scaling algorithm. One more detail, be sure to only use it on the training data and not scale on your entire data set. This was with me for the week and I truly hope you enjoyed this video as 
much as I did. So be sure to subscribe and hit that image of me coming up right now. And please like this video also so you can get more of this content and learn more about your favorite topic, machine learning.